uh, self-made millionaire tips with Colin Plume, a uh, serial entrepreneur with another serial entrepreneur, Daniel Lynch. Uh, excited to uh, dive into some some fun topics. Uh, I, we off camera, you're talking, you're a Joshua Tree, so you're uh, you're getting <laughs> inspired in the in the digital world, which is which is always cool. And uh, so, tell me, I, listen, I know I'm in the marketing space with a number of my businesses. I think anyone that has any kind of entrepreneurial uh, wherewithal needs to know those things and 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 how to be there. How did you you build? You're building companies. You're you're doing things in healthcare. Um, how did how did getting AI involved in that? How did that sort of come to be? How did, how did that all happen? For yeah, you? yeah. So you know, artificial intelligence is the next industrial revolution. There's no doubt about it. And I had been kind of waiting for years for it to come to a nexus, an intersection of where I could actually use it. Right? Because before then, it was this whimsical idea. And basically, at the end of 2022, I had a client saying, "Hey." I'm going to be creating this really cool app to translate in real time using this company called OpenAI. You should check it out. And this is before the big wave. And wow. so I immediately signed up for it. And I was like, wow, I could ask questions and it can create a conversation. And so, you know, over the last, you know, 16, 18 months, whatever it may be, I basically have just tried to figure out different use cases of how can I program the AI to understand who I am? How can I create a memory or what they call a vector database for it to pull industry specific knowledge in, um, take a tone of voice and basically just started using it to win my time back that as an entrepreneur, I was in the midst of burnout, um, you know, trying to scale, trying to get revenue, trying to hire, but it all just, it, you feel kind of stuck sometimes, right? But with AI, I was able to automate a lot of my processes, have someone to speak with about code snippets that I'm writing. And instead of me spending 20 hours testing out these code snippets, boom, right in front of me, it fixed it in real time. Wow. And when I started being able to get that, it, it kind of gave me that fire again to get organized, get staff and train them to do the same right? And give them boundaries and standard operating processes so that they're set up for success with something very technical where now they're empowered to do more. And basically, you know, my team of eight can do the team, the work of 80 uh, using AI. Right. And a big part of this was that you uh, are in the the healthcare, a niche of, of high-end healthcare where um, someone that is you know, uh, a wealthier person that that wants to do something outside of the traditional healthcare system, and they have, you know, like obviously everyone's watching this this guy, uh, Brian Johnson, right? The the guy who's trying to turn he's forty something. He's trying to turn into trying to reverse the clock, yeah, reverse the clock kind of thing. So, in essence, sort of what your one of your businesses is 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 for people that either want to do that or they maybe they just they have nagging something and they have the where they have the money and means to sort of change their lifestyle change how they're living maybe they're in pain or tired or, or whatever it is you one of your businesses is sort of helping people find that that right match in the in the health well, in the non-traditional well, healthcare space well you know basically i fell into the in the world of integrative holistic medicine um i had started a patient advocacy medical billing company called medical bill gurus my family filed bankruptcy for medical bills and i just felt like when my dad passed away i was an engineer i didn't feel like i was actually solving any problems that mattered and so i went head first into just saying let's see what happens with patient advocacy and what i actually discovered was that a majority of the people who go to these high ticket clinics are average people who are facing um, a lot of chronic illness, complex disease, cancer, Lyme disease, mold toxicity, uh, Parkinson's, dementia, and really biohacking longevity, it's the same thing, right? You're just not sick, but you're receiving holistic treatments that repair your body naturally, right? Maybe helping certain genes that turned on, turn back to their state where they're not causing DNA mutations. Um, but IV therapy is a huge component of that, which is what you're getting to with that as well as the, the biohacking, the, the cold baths, the sauna. It's blown up since COVID. My business is 4X during COVID. And 
more than ever, people are realizing that conventional medicine does not do the due diligence that you would expect just because someone has MD behind their name. And that after COVID, more and more people are realizing they need someone who's going to look at the dots of, you know, if you've got long haul COVID and it's reactivated with Epstein-Barr virus or some of these other things that you had underlying, that's what's causing your issues. And so uh, my marketing agency, we use AI to create content for a variety of different clinics, as well as the two mobile IV therapy companies that I own. And basically the AI is already biased to take a conventional approach to healthcare that if you were to ask it, what's the best course of treatment for, for cancer, let's say, or for, for longevity, it would give you a very generic response that's pre-programmed just like the average healthcare system is, right? Of this is what PubMed says, this is what the CDC says. But with what I've done though, for my particular clients is create data sets and fine tune the AI to take an integrative holistic approach, still science-based. So all the data and science is still referenced, but it's not gonna be biased to only think about one side of the equation, which is what we see on Google Bing. And when people are looking for answers to health problems and going to their conventional doctor. So I got two questions for you based on that. And I'm glad you brought those things up. One, I do IVs. I, I do it from time to time. I, I was doing them more consistently. My wife does it. But I've read also on the other side that it's hard to prove that it actually does anything. And, and you know, I've read uh, uh, New Yorker, New York Times. I've had, I've, but I, I know that when I do it, I do feel better. And I don't know if it's psychosomatic or if it's actually <laughs> doing placebo it. effect, right? Yeah, right. I mean, I don't I don't know. So that that's sort of my first question is is I mean, just the IV itself is have they proven that it it actually helps? Well, well, well here's helps? Well, here, here's the deal, right? Let me ask you this question. If there was research to show that prevention was an effective health solution what would happen to our healthcare system overnight? If, if people started actually doing things that are natural and we had fewer sick people and fewer chronically ill people, right? What would happen to the hospital system, the pharmaceutical industry, if you could say that, hey, this is more effective and it's only costing you one thousandth of the cost, right? right? And so it's if you were to go do the research, right? And look online, there are documented studies of a lot of IVs, okay? Um, High-dose vitamin C for cancer is very well researched, right? But the reality is Medicare insurance companies won't cover it, all right? right. But they'll cover chemotherapy, which is overpriced, and with Medicare is not even allowed to negotiate a drug price, right? So they're paying astronomical amounts more. And so the reality, and, and I'm a big crypto guy too, and we're going to see a big movement in decentralized science in the next bull run, but think of how much research has probably been done, but never released because it did not fit a certain narrative, right? Yeah, and that, and, and if you look at the pharmaceutical companies, they're already jumping on DSI for one reason, because they want to be part of it, because what that project's going to be doing is that all the research will be published, good or bad, on the blockchain, Right. And that if you go look at medical journals in Japan, Germany, Mexico, and abroad and translate them, you will find there is plenty of research, right? Um, and that the to be play devil's advocate though, right, too, what is going into the average IV bag, right? How much of it are you actually getting, right? right? That's, because that's the, been the argument, how much are you actually, does your body actually consume? The, the things that I read is that you, you, basically pee most of it out that you don't keep. Yeah. Well, that's, that's well you know, happens. it depends on what you're doing, right? If you drip it super fast, there's only so much your body can absorb in a certain period of time, right? In your, in the plasma of your blood, right? But if you do it slow, like some of them, like NAD is supposed to be done slow. It's supposed to, it gets a better absorption, right? But what I could tell you though, is that with what I've done, I've actually put together the IV protocols for both of my companies, had them approved by three board certified medical doctors, right? And that it's really about looking at the biochemistry of what's going on in a particular person's body. Everybody will feel better with more fluids because on average, we're more dehydrated, right? Everybody needs magnesium. Anybody who says you don't need more magnesium is lying to you. We're all deficient in it. And that alone will make you feel like a million dollars if you're anxious or stressed, right? 
and that it really needs to come out that there does need to be more regulation on it and also more research of what these actually are doing for people versus saying that they're, you know, you know, I'll tell you this, right? A lot of people during COVID didn't know what to do, right? We heard ivermectin was horse dewormer only to come out really later and say, actually, it's super effective, right? Because it didn't fit the narrative at the time. They've been using ivermectin for over 20 years for cancer, because if you lower the viral load on someone, it boosts their immune system, right? It's the same thing with the IVs is that we're all programmed to believe a certain narrative until that narrative is like what we all are told to believe, right? Because they can't deny it anymore, well, the right? Power, the power and the money is going and they're manipulating the search and what we should be reading and and no oh yeah, sense. and I, and I think them putting it on the blockchain is what, which was one of the the things that always attracted me to uh, crypto was the idea that there'd be you know independent sources on the blockchain that could move away from you know Google and Yahoo and all these places that are so easily manipulated. Uh, oh, it's crazy, and censorship is real, right? Anybody who denies it is 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 lying to themselves. That, you know, if you do not fit a certain narrative of how you say you do things, not just for healthcare, but for a lot of things, it is not promoted on the algorithm. It's sometimes suspended, you're blacklisted, shadow banned. Um, and that in, you know, the great, you know, in the Renaissance that we're in, right, a lot of people are questioning, what should I believe, right? Just because you saw how lied to we were with COVID and it's still coming out of whether, you know, however you view the vaccine or ivermectin or this or that, you realize that my, the only thing I always have to say about COVID is tell me one other chronic complex disease where there's only one standard of care and anybody who deviates from what the global standard of care is, is subject to medical licensure, you know, persecution, right? Right. You know, you have Harvard, MIT, you know, Duke, you know, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, everywhere in the whole world said this is the only course of action versus, you know, a lot of what my doctors were pushing was like IV methylene blue, ozone therapy, all very controversial if you look at the front page of Google. But if you go past the first page of Google, you get into the good stuff of how that benefits people. And that's why IV therapy honestly changed my life in holistic medicine that I realized I had a mold toxicity issue and I lost a hundred pounds when I started doing IVs to detox. And it was very brutal at some points, but now I feel like better than ever. Um, and I'm a firm believer. a hundred pounds. Yeah. Oh my God. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, and I was very estrogenic because we live in an, an environment full of xenoestrogens, whether it be from the cologne, the perfume, the air freshener, um, you know, all those phthalates, um, you know, you look at mold toxicity shuts down um, a young male's testosterone production, right? It makes them more estrogenic, right? And really what I learned, the common denominator of a lot of chronic disease and why I'm so passionate about this and why I love bringing the engineering and science into it, right? Is environmental disease is what dictates a lot of other disease, right? The water you drink, the air you eat, the, the food you eat, the air you breathe, um, where you sleep, right? And that a majority of all people in this country are suffering with homes that are not properly ventilated, leading to, to sick, uh, sick building syndrome is what they call it, where the house isn't breathing, so it's full of mold toxins, and those mold toxins cause havoc, right? They're linked to cancer, this and that. But no one will talk about that and look at a root cause. We'd rather say, you have cancer, you have autoimmune disease, right. but what are the biochemical malfunctions that are occurring and what is causing those, what catalysts are occur causing those reactions to occur in your body, right? And yeah. that's what- Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, a lot of it has to do, when you talk about root cause, I mean, a lot of it has to do with, you know, how our country is set up and where people are living and how they're living and- you know, if you get into the root cause that, you know, people that are living in, in a lot of apartment buildings, you know, the filters haven't been changed and maybe that carpet hasn't been changed. I mean, the, the, the onus would be on, you know, these massive, you know, companies that have, yeah. right. Yeah. So there, that's not a, an agenda that they're going to be willing to, to kind of push out. Well, let's talk about the airlines even, right? That why is it that when you go on a 45 minute flight, you get jet lag the same way you would on a 12 hour flight, right? The only difference is, is that the air you're breathing in is full of petrochemicals um, from jet fuel being burned, right? And then on the flip side, think of all the moisture in those air vents and how often are those ever cleaned, right? They're not. 
The only thing that could that happened from COVID for the airlines industry was that they were required to do a negative pressure so that the air wasn't recycled as much. And so it helped it a little bit, but think about, you know, and really I worked with a phenomenal doctor who taught me a lot of this, but if you go study chronic disease and cancer following 1972, 1972 was when we had the OPEC oil crisis and energy efficient buildings became the norm due to economical concerns with energy, right? So now you have vacuum tight buildings pumping in air from the outside with no way for the air to get out with cheap porous building materials, which are colonized by the spores in the air with the humidity. And thus you have mold in almost every building in the United States and in, in civilized countries. I mean, it's a huge problem. And that's really where my businesses have blown up was unfortunately, you know, helping those people find where to get treatment and spend a significant amount of money. Um, but that, you know, you have to do a lot of these IVs, which are very expensive and other treatments to get their lives back. But I've seen miracles occur from all this. Where So let's, let's talk, uh, let's get into the marketing side of it and, and you know, what your AI is able to do or, or uh, attempts yeah. to do is, you know, you Google, uh, you know, I'm dehydrated. I'm, I can't, you know, I can't kick this cough or, you know, any of the things and you're going to get your typical, you know, ads from whoever's buying those ads. You're going to get WebMD. You're going to get, how does some of these not as popular ideas, uh, how do you, how do you, I mean, cause at the end of the day, if you're not on the first page, pretty much it's, it's hard. Top to three, top three. <laughs> right, yeah. Exactly. Uh, how are you able to kind of infiltrate the, the system? so to speak. Yeah. So, so basically using AI, the first thing that I do is I create what I call a knowledge base, right? A knowledge base is the term that's come around basically with headless CMSs and with how AI is being deployed, that it's going to contain all the information relevant to the industry, the client, and specific knowledge bases that are subsidiary to it, okay? And so the first thing I do is I get a list of every competitor in the industry, and I get a list of all their websites, their social media, um, as well as other businesses that offer the same services. So that way I can program the AI knowledge base that I want to keep this same opinion or stance on these topics, right? So if I say high dose vitamin C, it talks about the benefits versus linking you to a naturopath who killed someone, which was like a one-off thing that Google will show, but it won't show the other stuff, right? Right. The next thing I do is I upload every single document that the uh, figurehead has ever written. So if they've written a book, if they've ever done YouTube videos, I upload the YouTube videos to it and I transcribe them, all of their writing on the internet, and I create a tone of voice as well as take their expert knowledge and I put it into another layer, okay? And next where is that, the thing I don't understand to explain this to me because I'm a dummy. So where is that layer happening? So like, obviously I'm out there a million different ways. And and from, you know, you talk about crypto, I have a cryptocurrency trading platform called My Digital Money. So I talk about crypto. I'm, I'm you know, we have a gold precious metals business. I have a hot sauce. I have an HR, I got a bunch of different, that I talk about all of them. Where, where it is, like, I understand where you can get it from, but where are you, <laughs> how are you pushing it out there so that it can- Yeah, it's called a vector database, okay? So I use one called pinecone.io. And basically what it is, is a vector in mathematics is basically a, it's, it's, you know, a, a force and it's a magnitude and direction, right? So what it is, is that it helps to position the word choice and how topics are stored into a Cartesian coordinate system to some extent, that's not just three coordinates long, it's like longer than that, right? It's multidimensional. And that using that technology is how we can take a lot of information and can make it more concise to be recalled more efficiently. So right. it's called vector database. And it's basically like a hard drive, if you imagine, of storing things, but for AI in the format that can be used in multiple directions or multiple applications, okay? And that what you do is you create the storage base and then you connect the language learning model to that vector database. And the LLM is what it's called, okay? Would be OpenAI, Anthropopic Claude, um, Google Genesis, Facebook Llama, right? 
And once you do that, each one of those LLMs can take that data and give you different outputs based on their strengths. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll check the output of each one of which one is kind of more in line. And then I'll actually take all of them together and then run them through each other again to have them look at the output from all of them and then take kind of the average of them and then run it through each model again to see what the output is, right? And then you do iterations and create very task specific um, guidance to say, hey, right, pretend you're uh, integrative medical doctor named Dr. Nathan Goodyear of Brio Medical in Scottsdale, Arizona. You're a board certified OBGYN surgeon with years of experience in conventional medicine. Um, but for the last 15 years, I've become an integrative holistic doctor that has treated thousands of patients from around the world with all stages and all types of cancer, right? And give it all those data points so it knows who you are or who you want to be, right? <clears throat> and then at that point, I create like an outline and you can use what's called agents. So uh, ChatGPT just released their marketplace. There's a couple other tools that help you with this. But what you do is you create specific tasks for each agent to do on the page. So if you want to create an image, then you can fine tune the, the prompt and everything to make an image relative to that doctor, right? Or for that blog post. And then most of all, what I do at the end of it is I use a variety of SEO tools and I create what's called topical clusters. And so if I want to rank for, let's say, foods that cause cancer, that would be the topical cluster, right? And then I would create probably a hundred different long tail keywords that link to that post and say, do Doritos cause cancer? Do Twinkies cause cancer? Do, you know, does McDonald's These cause would cancer? These all be common. Now it knows what a common search is. And so you're, you're feeding it the exact search for- Focus keyword, the focus keyword. The focus and, keyword. Then, okay. and then giving it what's called the LSI keywords, latent semantic indexing which are the synonyms. So if I say, do Doritos cause cancer? Then I would also put, do Cool Ranch Doritos cause cancer? Do Cheddar Doritos cause cancer? Uh, Dorito ingredients, Doritos carcinogen. Hey, I, got a, I, got a, I got a test for you. I got a question for you. Can you do this? I have a very small cryptocurrency trading platform. It's a small, I'm the owner, my face is out there. I started it because I think that a lot of these cryptocurrency trading platforms are all bullshit. They're all stealing like FTX. I predicted that years before. And <laughs> I would just me, small company, small budget. You know, I don't have Matt Damon. Uh, you know, I don't have I don't have Larry David, who by the way, that was the, the best commercial, I think. <laughs> like basically said it was bullshit. And he was right on their commercial, and then you know, they went down. Could I compete with this, what you're talking about? Could I compete in some form against a Coinbase or? Uh, uh, well, well, that that's just one part of the strategy, right? No, you know, no I'm, I'm at, I'm at, I'm throwing, I'm throwing it out. I'm either throwing you a curveball. I'm throwing you just like a. No, this is, well, I, I go up against Mayo Clinic with doctors who don't exist that I just find and then I build them up to compete. So. I have no problem tackling Goliath, right? But you have to attack from land, air, and sea in Blitzkrieg and stand your ground as you get it and build up a following and database, right? So for what you're talking about, um, so with this lo long tail SEO approach or this blogging approach, that is top of funnel, right? And so what we would be doing is we would be targeting, let's say for you, right? Um, if we were to do this for crypto, I would be going after layer two solutions that are emerging and blogging about their projects and then, you know, seeing who searches that, right? And you better believe if you have something that's somewhat worthwhile for like, I'm a big fan of DSO, Decentralized Social Media, if you're familiar with them, yeah, right? right? And they're and they're kind of, they, they just won 198% in the last 30 days. So, and their project is, it's got a great backbone. It's, it's healthy, right? So if I were to blog all about DSO as they're rising, I could pull in that traffic, right? Same thing with like, let's say quant, right? Which is the backbone of how Ethereum will work with layer twos, right? And go after those more very expertise driven keywords that a regular, like with what I do marketing is that I like to go down the rabbit hole. Most marketing agencies, they glance at the surface and they're like, oh, I'm not an expert in that. Well, you're never going to be because you're not trying, right? And go find what people are searching on Google Trends and get that in there. 
but we can blog all day, but you also have to focus on what's called EEAT, which is experience, expertise, authority, and trustworthiness with the search engines. And so when you're automatically in the finance crypto space, okay, you are in a very um, high risk niche that they call your money, your life, your health, YM, YM, YH, YL, okay? That if someone goes to your blog about crypto and uses your platform, and you're actually FTX, well, now they're go using Google to go into a scam. So Google has to build trust with you for you to get those rankings. So what that would be is that would be where the public relations aspect comes in. Um, I have four full-time PR publicists. And so we do uh, PR nonstop every day, where basically what we would do is take you and pitch you to journalists and other uh, media publications or um, radio, TV, whatever it may be, get you placements, okay? And then basically you would give us your comments, your expert commentary on that. And then you would get featured in let's say Forbes or Fortune Magazine or Fox News, CNN, LA Tribune, Miami Herald. Then you get that backlink. And then I would take that link and I would embed it in what's called your structured markup data, data and schema profile for the author of all the blogs so that when Google crawls that blog, they'll see that if your name is the author on your bio page, it shows that you're also featured on Fortune Magazine, Forbes, CoinGecko, Coinbase, whatever it may be. And we could actually get backlinks probably from Coinbase to your website, which would drive even more credibility and Absolutely. help you write. Absolutely. You know, that's how I would do it. Yeah, you know? no, that's, I, I, and I want to offer, I definitely want to, talk to you about that a little bit more because I think uh, it might be something worth uh, worth discussing because we're starting to trend in a lot. And I am getting published in a, in a number of those places, but maybe not exactly the way that you're suggesting it. Um, yeah. But we are, we are kind of running long and deep. So just, I think what we need to do is like, and I want to have you back on because I feel like we could just talk for hours and hours. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, tell me what's like, where do you think, what do you think is going to happen 2024, 2025, with AI, with what you're doing? Is there any predictions, any bold prediction that you want to make here? That yeah, I, I think we're coming to a really critical moment for society and humanity, to be honest, right? Um, we've built a society since the 50s that's built on, you go to college, you get a degree, you don't really use the degree, you get a comfortable nine to five job in the suburbs, right? And the reality is at the same time, We've also made it where minimum wage in some places is $20 an hour, right? That we've enabled people to think that if they don't know anything and have no skills, that they're entitled to a livelihood because they exist. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, as we look at the economy and the volatility of, even if people say that the economy is perfectly fine right now, right? It's so over leveraged and there's so many things on the back end that we don't know about that one by one, I think what's going to happen is every industry will get picked off by AI tools and every business owner in their mind, whether they say it or not, is thinking, can I replace this person with AI? Mm -hmm. When this person retires, I don't need to find someone new. I can use AI. Right. This person wants a raise. I can't afford them. I'll use AI. Mm -hmm. And with my agency, I can tell you right now that you know we help businesses automate using AI. And there's no doubt that we've replaced some jobs with that already. Right. And that as that becomes more and more mainstream, people are going to hate me and say, I'm the bad guy. And I'm going to say, you need to take ownership and realize times are changing and that you need to learn the skills and actual tangible, applicable skills to do something or a robot will do it for you or a human using a robot will do it for you versus a lot of people like, well, I have a college degree. I should be making $60,000. The average college degree is useless, right? I mean, it, it really doesn't teach you anything. I went to engineering school. No engineer who graduates engineering school can actually design something because it's just memorizing problems in the back of the book and then you know, going to an exam and then forgetting it because you never use it in corporate America, right? And, right. and, and, like, and I was like, so, it was so comical. I mean, when I was an engineer, it was paper pushing to the fullest, right? As an engineer, like very lucrative, six-figure job, woo, woo And I'm like, this is the most boring thing ever, right? And 
you better believe that with AI merging doctors, we look at doctors, right? Um, I don't know if you've seen those AI tools that can go look at, um, you know, PET scans for cancer. They're more accurate than humans, right? And so what happens if all of a sudden, not just the bottom tier jobs, but the top tier jobs start to get squeezed and that we have a emerging class of people who can't contribute and we need to take care of them because we can't just let people go, right? But Bill Gates said it best years ago that we should have a tax on every job that's replaced by AI to support that emerging class that will occur as you know an industry evolves using it, that people will be displaced and they're great people. There's nothing against them, right? Like it's not everybody's made for technology, <laughs> but you have to adapt to where things are going or else a 12 year old with an iPad can do more than someone with a PhD. You know, I mean, I mean, that's just the reality, that's right? The truth. I mean, that is really that... It, it, the landscape is changing. And listen, I, I think we've all known that, you know, everyone accepted the menial jobs being done by robots, but now, you know, the, the more complex and the middle management and these kind of things that are shifting away, people are sort of attaching. It's just, a, it's just a mindset thing that, you know, will be overcome uh, because yeah. there's so many jobs right now that are, that are going to continue to get uh, replaced over time. And, and I see it with people, you know, peers, people I know, you know, jobs. I know a lot of people worked in entertainment. A lot of those jobs are just kind of getting wiped away. A lot of those writer jobs, a lot of the stuff just kind of. Instagram morphed. influencers, right? You saw that girl that has the Instagram AI account. It's a fake um, AI person. And she has an Instagram influencer profile with hundreds of thousands of followers making all this money <laughs> with, with, with endorsements. And it's a fake AI avatar, yeah. like yeah. literally, right? Absolutely. And you're like, how do we compete with that? Or you look at Starbucks, that Starbucks is measuring the productivity of every Starbucks employee. Mm -hmm. So how many cups of coffee are you making? Whatever. And it's like, if you're not a top performer at whatever you do, there is no more participation trophies, right? <laughs> you go down to Tijuana and Mexico at the border. That's, that's how a lot of people are, right, man? You see some crazy stuff down there and no one's going to go help those people. But in the U.S., we've expected, oh, the government will take care of us. But what happens if we do default on the national debt at some point? Because it can't just keep going up thirty trillion dollars without some repercussion, you know? That's why people got to buy gold? That's what I've been telling them. The only money, the only real money in the world is gold, baby. That's it. There's nothing left. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everyone's been laughing at me when gold was at twelve hundred dollars an ounce, and now it broke two thousand. It's like, of course it did, because our the other money is not worth anything. So. Yeah, no one knows. And it's so crazy. You know, we live in a society of headline readers where people just believe everything at first glance. Oh, the economy's fine. I saw on the news today. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, how how much can they can quantitative easing and they keep it's like they've broken every macroeconomic policy there is. Absolutely. It's like it doesn't even macroeconomics is useless now, right? It doesn't they can just break all the rules, right? Yeah. So the end of the debt bubble. That's the that's the, the, the Congress and the government has just decided they're going to test their fate for as long as they can test. Or them. it seems intentional as well to somehow make it where there is some big fall and then reliance on the government, right? I mean, we I have a lot of people. I think a lot of people believe that's what COVID was. You know, that's that's how yeah. it came about. It's just starting to get people in the mindset of of just relying on the government completely for everything. Yeah. And, you know, we Medicare for all, we hear people talk about that, you know, and my thoughts are, is, you know, if you talk to any doctor, man, they can't afford to make a living off of Medicare reimbursements. Yeah, oh, so yeah. it's like, Your it's doctor like doctors today takes cash. They're, they're not, they have no interest in, in, uh, uh, have, having anything to do, you know, I'm having, I've had a lot of surgeries in my body. I have hip replaced. I'm getting another hip. The, the, the best guys that do this, the doctors that do this, they take cash up front. They don't, you know, they'll get some money later from wherever they're going to get it from, but they want cash. I mean, the, the people that are really good at their profession realize they're not going to wait around. They're not going to go through medical or medical or the insurance. They're just going to get paid. And it, yeah, it, obviously a big part of your business is, is aligning people with doctors that, can really solve the problems because you could go through the medical system for years and years and never get solved. And um, we build out too. So if someone were to pay 50,000 for an ACL surgery, we could build that out and help them navigate the out of network member reimbursement 
process with my company, Medical Bill Gurus, where it's my opinion is any doctor who's worthwhile will opt out of Medicare because it's a nightmare, okay? Yeah. And it will be more and more cash heavy to the point where everyone who said, oh, I want Medicare for all, I'm going to be like, you do realize that you're just making it so that everyone is on Medicare and then there's lines to get treatment and then it's poor care. The sure. doctor can't afford to have good staff, right? And it all falls apart. And that's why I believe a solution on the blockchain for healthcare is where it needs to go for some type of outcome-based care that a doctor gets air. Get this. What if doctors were incentivized to keep people from getting sick? Right. Right. Imagine that. Imagine if they got airdropped because their cholesterol and liver readings were better. And then maybe the, the patient actually gets airdropped as well. And their premiums go down as long as they take accountability that if you're going to eat donuts and get super fat and have cancer and diabetes for the rest of your life, well, guess what? I don't care about Obamacare. You should pay more for health insurance. Well, and the problem is, is the government probably doesn't want that because Social Security doesn't have enough money if people are actually living longer. So they're probably, yeah. it's probably the wrong way. You know, I, I think that, you know, this Medicare, this Social Security thing that they set up that was supposed to be temporary. Now people really think it's going to keep them going forever. And, and, uh, yeah. I don't think the government really wants people living to 120, 130. Well, if you're, if you're an illegal immigrant in California, you can have all of your health coverage guaranteed and paid for by the state with no way to get treatment. Right. You're like, it's just so upside down everywhere we go. Right. And, you know, at some point with AI, whether the U S holds it back or not, some other country will emerge as the superpower because they won't be dealing with all these games their country will know like hey like we got to use this right we got to we got to have a lot of growth and you look at europe i mean france and germany like some of the engineers i'm working with out there they're going next level right and their country's all messed up too but there's going to be an almost new working class that's very successful they're not going to be the elite top whatever but they will be able to make more money than ever using ai because there'll be such a need at some point in my agency in the last year we're just i have a waiting list right now like we're blowing up by the day because more and more people want to automate things and get rid of humans you Absolutely. know yeah well, listen, I, I appreciate it. I want to get into it more. And I do want to talk to you about the thing I talked about a little bit off air, but self-made millionaire tips, Daniel, you're a wealth of knowledge and, and young and exciting and, and uh, controversial, which I like too. And and uh, hopefully this doesn't get banned on a number of the places that we're going to show this. Maybe we are. Maybe that's good. <laughs> that is good. Could be good. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Noble Gold. MyDigitalMoney.com. If you're looking to do crypto in your IRA, that's one of our sponsors, My Digital Money. Uh, and uh, everywhere else, see you on Spotify, Apple. Where are we? Spotify, Apple, all those places. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it. Thank you, my friend.